Well, we have a rather curious subject this morning, but I think it is one that has meaning and considerable contemporary significance. To study our heritage from the past is not simply a waste of time, because most of that heritage is still with us. If not in the political and social circles of life, at least in the internal subjective moods of our own existence. At a very early date, it became evident that the human being was in serious difficulty trying to understand where he was, what he was, and why he was. He looked around him and he saw a nature unfolding, but behind this nature, as he saw it, there must be something else but he had no way of really trying to discover what it was. He was bound within the small area of his own life existence. His expectancy in those days was very little. It is sometimes estimated that the average human being in those uh, early cave periods, life was probably about 10 years, maybe a few more. Many of them didn't reach majority at all. So, it was a strange world with everything happening and no explanation for why it happened. Gradually, it became obvious that the human being had to have some type of internal existence which would carry with it faith and hope in his material life. Gradually, we find the rise of various beliefs probably some of the earliest sort of shamanistic, the belief in spirits and ghosts, all this type of thing. All these believings came not from a carefully studied or planned exploration of nature. They came from a desperation of an individual or a group of injured individuals struggling desperately for hope, to escape from loneliness, to no longer be an isolated creature in an unknown world. The human being was very much like a castaway on a desert island. He had no resources available to him except what he could contrive with his own ingenuity. As time went on, there was inevitably a demand for some type of organized faith faith in realities that were not visible. But how was the primitive man going to analyze invisible realities? How is modern man going to analyze them? Actually, it all seems to have arisen within the person himself. The desperate need resulted in a kind of solution, a solution that was sufficient for the moment and which it was always hoped would be improved and perfected in the course of time. This temporary solution is still the answer that we have to use. For with all our progress, with all our skills, with all our intellectualism, the individual is still lonely. He is still comparatively helpless, helpless in a world infinitely too great for him. Now he not only has to combat nature or adjust to its circumstances, but he must try to survive the complex situation set up by human nature in this little thing we call the earth. So altogether, our beginnings of faith, hope, and love lie in the desperate need for something that was superior to self, something that was stronger than we are, some ever-present help in time of trouble. Trouble was common, help was scarce. The individual went through countless miseries and misfortunes, but there had to be some hope, something to sustain the struggling creature in its long evolutionary path. There came up, of course, shamanism, which we find among the American Indians, the medicine priest, with the rattle and the spells and the incantations. 
and with second sight and mysteries, who worked with the sick and gave hope of recovery. Then in other parts of the world, other types of help gradually evolved. But these different forms had their foundation in the human demand for hope. And the only way he could find hope, apparently, was through a strange contrivance with familiar and apparently hopeless elements. The American Indian in the Southwest, for instance, was very much concerned with creating charms, various good luck symbols, protective symbols. And yet he had no way of knowing, really, what would protect him or where he would find anything that was sufficient. So he made a move that has become universal. He said, here is a pretty little pebble. Here is another pretty little pebble. These little petals, uh, petals and stones and flowers and so forth are pretty. They're nice. But in themselves, they can't do any particular good to us. But now comes magic. If we took two of these objects and put them together and tied them with sinew and painted something on them, they suddenly became medicine. Magic was bestowed upon a combination of factors where it was not regarded as existing in the separate elements themselves. As a result of this, it gradually dawned on the human being that almost any combination of circumstances which he could contrive if brought together, had a new meaning, a meaning that might contribute to his own survival. We know also that in most ancient peoples, there arose a class of medicine priests, of uh, sacerdotal spiritual leaders. Uh, these became the foster parents of humanity. Uh, the simple people depended upon these leaders for hope. And it became obvious that for some mysterious reason, these leaders produced remarkable results. These people, uh, they, these medicine priests, apparently performed miraculous cures. And even today on some of the Indian reservations, uh, white people in trouble sneak over the border and try to get an Indian medicine man to help them. They have more faith in him than they have in their own physician. Now these uh, problems perhaps are well ex explained in the Bible, where we find the definite statement that faith has helped to make us whole. Something to believe in, something that has hope, is a source of physical help. It helps us uh, de uh, reco recover from mental ailments, from emotional stress, and from physical disease. Faith is a tremendously healing power, the only answer we have to the destructive force of fear. So from faith came a great development of beliefs and ideals. These were not always provable or demonstrable, but that was not important. It wasn't whether or not you could scientifically sustain them. The real answer was that people accepted them, believed in them, deposited in them hope for the future, faith in the power of something to protect. As time went on and religions and philosophies became more complicated, it was inevitable that efforts should be made to rationalize faith to bring it under the control of reason. It was apparent that if the mind supported the faith, it was stronger. And so we have all kinds of philosophies, mysticisms, esotericisms, and every type of intellectual interpretation of natural phenomena. We have it today. But today we are in a little difficulty. Knowing that faith basically is the very cornerstone of survival. We find that many forms of knowledge, particularly scientific knowledge, exist largely to destroy faith. They want to take away from us the belief in those very invisible principles upon which we have learned to depend for 
peace of soul and peace of mind and peace of heart. So in this confusion, a great many persons have lost their spiritual orientation. They have lost their ability to accept the fact that there is a universal good, a universal reality, that life is purposed, that there are reasons for things. And as gradually the sciences limit perspective and force the individual into a constant acceptance of material things as the only realities. As this goes on, faith dims, hope fades away, and the individual is reduced to a state from which he escaped ages ago by rising above the level of materialistic uh, primitive existence. Now, in the course of all this problem, it, certain facts of human life became increasingly obvious, and these facts of life are perhaps somewhat summarized in our re relationship with the mystery of death. It is uh, a problem that the primitive man never could understand. He tried to dramatize this mystery. He tried to glorify it. He placed a, t a treasury of art, beauty, and wealth in the tombs of his kings. He did everything to imagine that man after death lived in a beautiful land, but he had no way of proving it. He had no way of justifying it other than by faith. But this faith was so important, so desperately needed, that gradually a new type of interpretation of life was built upon faith. Faith justified, not rationalized. It became obvious that there had to be some reason for existence. Materialism destroys that reason. Idealism supports that reason. And faith lingers and clings desperately to support, to something to make things better. Omar summarizes it in one of the quatrains when he says, strange it, is it not, that of those myriad few before us passed the gates of darkness through. Not one return to tell us of the way that to discover we must travel to. This pessimism was something that sickened. Pessimism is always a disease. It never amounts to anything constructive. But pessimism is an inevitable result of a hard, sharp look at circumstances without inner enlightenment to sustain us. So the problem of building this inner light can become, can become very important to all of us. In the course of time, the ancients developed a way of tying divinity closer to humanity. It was rather obvious to most people, even when they were comparatively savage, that no deity could listen to all the prayers of mankind, could listen to the two or three billion prayers that go up now every day to some gracious providence for help, for something to build hope upon, something by which the individual escapes the isolation of his own insufficiency. So gradually the invisible world was organized not by proof, but by necessity. This organization did, however, result in visualization. For the dreams that the individual had about the invisible world behind him and beyond him gradually came through in sleep patterns, resulting in an elaborate symbolism of inner survival. This is found in practically all the esoteric arts and sciences of antiquity that have descended to us. They have developed symbolisms of hope, symbolisms of survival, symbolisms of transformation by which the suffering and ills of society can be transcended. In this particular phase of the subject, therefore, we have gradually enlarged the concept of God. We enlarged it in one way and reduced it in another. Certainly, we do not have the thousands of deities that arose in Oriental religions.
But we do have a realization that there has to be something between man and God besides space. That this space, this interval of quality between our state and the divine state simply cannot be a vacuum. That in some mysterious way, the divine operates in the mortal existence. And in order to operate, it must have some instruments of operation. So we gradually developed in ancient times a belief in tutelary deities, godlings of various kinds, deities of agriculture. The Romans had gods that lived under the uh, these kitchen floor to take care of food. The Egyptians had their deities who plowed the fields of Amentet after death. Everywhere there were godlings and spirits that came uh, to help or to be present. Folklore is loaded with these concepts. Where did they come from? They were not really simply projects of imagination. They were the visualizations of hope, of faith, of the realization of a need and an inner conviction that there must be somewhere something to meet that need. Now we're talking about long ago, but we are not talking about things that no longer exist. The needs of our ancestors are still exactly the same as our own. We have, had make, we have made practically no progress in the area of the fulfillment of internal needs. We have gradually tried to assume that they did not exist. We have tried to limit existence to a single life. We have tried to assume that everything is accident and that all traits are hereditary. We do not have any solution to the great hunger of the human being for inner strength, for the power to meet the pressures of a world, a world around him constantly betraying the world within him. In this emergency, we find, therefore, in every major religion of the world, a development of intervening deities, beings of various qualities that existed between the final ultimate theology and the common mortal life of man. In Christian philosophy and religion, these have generally been called angels or archangels. They were messengers of the divine. These, as messengers, became very important. They brought the legends and mysteries of faiths necessary to the fulfillment of spiritual realities. There also arose the negative counterpart of these. For as the messengers came from above to bring light to man, so below, human beings rose to high degrees of spiritual development and saints and heroes began to intercede for human beings before the throne of deity. So a network of intercessions was created, a network of hope finally more or less justified by a, a network of speculations. Now, as time went on, these speculations became more and more firmly established in the human mind, until in many instances, these are no longer speculations. They are now traditional facts that have come to us through the wisdom of our ancestors. Now, maybe these uh, facts are more factual than we like to realize, because actually our best instrument to discover the facts of things must lie within ourselves. It is our own insight that is the nearest to truth that we can ever have. We can't find this truth out in the desert somewhere unless it stimulates insight. Unless something comes from within ourselves, the larger work cannot be perfected. In some cases, we have the rise of various orders of deities, such as those which we find among the American Indians again. And even now, in their religious rites and rituals, the Kachinas come from the mountains. And the human being, wearing a mask, and with certain ritualistic uh, accompaniments, 
is considered to be a temporary God. And this faith is still held firmly in the American Southwest. It is held in Asia among the shamanism of Mongolia. It is still held in many parts of the East, even among highly civilized and highly uh, skeptical peoples. The belief, the realization of the mask cult is very strong and probably will be for a long time to come. I remember when I was up in the northern end of India towards Darjeeling, that a group of Tibetan dancers came down to give a performance for the strange visitors from afar. Among the dancers was a little boy, probably five or six years old. Everybody loved that little boy. He was so charming and had such a quaint way of living and thinking and wore the cutest clothes imaginable. He was like a doll to the most of the people who saw him who came from outside of India. Then came the time for the dance and the little boy put on a mask with a grimacing face on it and decked himself out with some regalia and started to join the dancers. And in the course of the dance, this little fellow danced over towards the visitors, the tourists. They immediately scattered and hid. The moment the mask was on him, those who knew the little boy were still afraid of him. This is a subconscious situation that apparently we have not been able to cure even now. So the masks appear in Egypt in the temple rituals. They appear in the dramas of Greece. They appear in the dances and mysteries of Tibet, Mongolia, and Bhutan. They are still used in Japan and China. They are found among the Incas. They are, were a part of the regalia of the Aztecs and the people of Central America. Mask dancers and costume dancers are still found in many parts of Europe. The whole situation is that with the change of perspective, the way something that isn't normal or common is introduced, immediately there are strange inner acceptances. Something happens and the individual is no longer oriented to the materialism which has gradually crept into his nature. Now in the course of this same procedure, we have had a great roam, a roaming around of the mind in folklore, in emblemism, in symbolism, in alchemy, in Kabbalah, and many of these things, where the individual using ordinary elements, placing them in new combinations, causes them to become revelations of something superior or more important. Now, in the midst of all of this, we come to the classic Greeks. And in the classic case, of course, the most outstanding example of something is the spirit guide of Socrates. The uh, Socrates had a spirit that was born with him, according to his own statements. And this spirit was called a daimon. Our word demon comes from it, but it's not, it is a use that was made after it was assumed that all these pagan deities were devils. Actually, the demon was not an evil spirit, but a friend, a guide, and a counselor. And wherever Socrates was in danger or difficulty, his spirit came to him. The demon or guardian appeared, and he writes about it, discusses it, and tells of the examples of its presence. When, however, the time came for Socrates to die, when it was ordered that he take the hemlock and die of it, uh, poisoning, he says that his spirit left him weeping. Uh, the spirit was no longer with him. I am in his study of the mysteries of the Egyptians and Chaldeans describes in detail these familiar spirits. And uh, gradually we find more and more discussion of them and uh, Paracelsus von Hohenheim and many of the mystics of the Middle Ages recognized them. They were also recognized by the early church that there was something that uh, came along and sort of protected and helped and guided and became an invisible parent 
to a visible orphan, not necessarily because he lost his family, but because he was an orphan as far as his inner life was concerned. He was as a child left without parent. He was alone in a world, and he needed mothering. He needed someone to lean on. He needed something to strengthen and protect him in his efforts to live a good life. And so out of this came the concept of the guardian angel. The guardian angel, according to the stories about, about it that have come down to us, came into birth with the person itself. The, the angel came and remained with the person throughout life. And then uh, when the person died, the angel appeared to testify before the throne of deity of the virtues of the person it had protected through the years. Now this concept was never officially part <coughs> of the uh, Catholic or early Christian church, but it was said to be of the mind of the church. That is, it was accepted. A, a feast day was set aside for it, and as early as in the fourth and fifth centuries, it was discussed by the early church theologians. The direct source of the concept may have been the various nymphs and spirits of the Greeks. Also, the various guardian spirits and beings that protected the Egyptian living and dead. The direct form of it seems to have originated in Chaldea or Babylon. But there is no religion in the world of any importance today <clears throat> that does not have angels. They are found on the Buddhist monuments and in the beautiful Buddhist paintings and in the various statuary. They are found in China, in India, in Burma. They were very important in Persian, Persia. They occur frequently in the literature of the uh, Orthodox Jewish faith. They are part of the Christian story and they find them arising if ever the human being has been in the urgent need of help. They are a very essential part of the basic philosophy of Islam. So everywhere there are the beliefs in these beings. Beliefs that there are beings that can help and can stay with the individual throughout life. These invisible beings are sort of guardians, protectors. They are foster parents. They are the proof beyond all doubt that the human being is never left without guardianship and without love. These beings are a kind of mysterious benefactors. Sometimes they are regarded as having come from some great heights beyond human understanding. In the uh, Christian and Jewish concepts, uh, the uh, angels are represented as winged because they are constantly able to travel inconceivable distances to fulfill the needs and missions. They are also bringers of annunciations. They are re revealers of great spiritual happenings. They are the sources of visions and all kinds of uh, spiritual experiences. The, the artists of the Renaissance and earlier have made some magnificent paintings of the guardian angels and of the angels of the presence. And the ancient countries believed that they had angels that guarded their countries. And it was long believed in the Jewish people that uh, Michael, the archangel, was the guardian of Israel. All these different beliefs finally came down uh, to a problem of seeking some form of rational explanation for them. To have a belief that goes all over the world, accepted by some of the world's finest minds, that is not provable or demonstrable in terms of fact is always a difficult situation to face. And yet it has not interfered markedly with the belief in these beautiful beings who are the particular custodians of the divine love, sharing it with mortality and bringing it into the world. The Egyptians gave us some psychological clues to this situation. 
and also we can come down now to the physical problems of today to see if we can understand the psychology behind this particular situation. Perhaps best expressed by one of the mystics of uh, Europe, namely that where there is a great necessity that it must be filled, filled. It must occur if it is necessary. And where there is a great need for some form of spiritual security, it is certain that nature bestows it. The only thing is we are not quite wise enough or not open enough to understand what is actually happening. But here today, we are in a world of lonely people. People who are losing faith in themselves, losing faith in their society. Fear is becoming one of the most common of all emotions. We are more lonely, perhaps, than any time in the last 2,000 years. But we remember the journey of man, as described by Plotinus, where he said, life is a journey of the lonely to that which is alone. In other words, the individual goes to that which is the final supreme end of all existence, deity. And that deity, in a strange way, is also alone, having nothing to depend upon except its own internal eternity. So in this uh, phase of the matter, it is natural and was natural throughout all the cr crowded and suffering periods of history for humanity to build some kind of an image of faith, of hope, of charity, and to gradually lean more and more upon this without really knowing what it was all about. And the proof of the existence of the guardian angel did come to a great many people. It came in strange ways. The fulfillment of prayer, the individual asking for help, depending only upon the help of the invisible, received that help. And as a result, it, it seemed inevitable that all this faith was real, that all these hopes and prayers and divine expectations were part of a divine plan and not a mirage arising in the human mind itself. Actually, of course, there is no doubt in the world that the great benefit of the belief in the guardian angel was the fact that it strengthened character, that it provided inducement for virtue, that it made it easier to understand, easier to bear burdens, and to realize that no matter what happens, or how often it happens, or where it happens, no one is ever alone. We are never less alone than when alone, according to one of the poets. So this fact that we are not alone perhaps changes the entire destiny of many individuals. They suddenly feel themselves to have a strength that is not their own, a strength that is supported by a divine edict, by a divine presence, by something like an invisible mother or father that walks with them, that stays with them all through life. This comes up also, of course, in our Medist Buddhism, where the pilgrim going on his journey of pilgrimage from one shrine to another uh, wears a broad-brimmed straw or bamboo hat on which are the words that he walks with another, the another being the Buddha. So this another that is stronger than we are and yet is with us and is available to us night and day, anytime, anywhere, became the basis of a great deal of mystical experience. Mystical experience gradually bestowed upon this conviction dream and vision likenesses. Individuals saw these spirits. Paracelsus describes in detail all the nature spirits and the gnomes and the undines and the salamanders uh, that... Uh, Ancients believed were the custodians of flowers and plants. The American Indian in the plains had his totems. He had an animal spirit that guided him. He had to go out and perform vigil and learn what animal was to protect him. 
And when he went in vigil, in vigil and had a dream of an eagle, the eagle became his protector for the entire lifetime. And he prayed to it, and he recognized it, and he thought about it. And he knew that the strength of the eagle was his, as long as he kept the rules. Now this brings another interesting phase into the problem of the guardian angel. The effectiveness of this concept. This being that loved us would help always if we deserve it. Now this put a moral factor into the situation, which is perhaps a greater moral factor than any other that we have ever been able to conceive in the search for integrities. It is true that we believe in a large, remote way that the good life is the life that leads to salvation. But this is a very big thing, and we don't understand too much about salvation either. But what we do realize or feel is that if there is something that is taking care of us and loves us and will take care and protect us if we keep its laws, and this is all right in our own hearts, in our own houses, in our homes, everywhere where we go, there is an immediacy about it that seems to have a tremendous uh, power of help. And of course, there's another factor in the concept of the guardian angel. This angel knows everything that we do. Therefore, we may think we can hide, but we can't. We cannot perform in secret any act that the guardian angel doesn't know about. And sometimes children will actually ask the guardian angel to look the other way, but there's no proof that it does. <laughs> the, uh, the idea, therefore, is that there is a, a companion sent from heaven who loves us, who constantly guides us, who helps to make difficult problems more simple. And when the time comes for us to leave this world, we will then find that this angel has stood for us in heaven and has witnessed our virtues before the throne of the Almighty. We find in, the, in Matthew, for instance, that Jesus makes reference to the angels when he says that these angels, that every child who comes into the world has an angel, and that when the time comes to that child to depart from this world, the angel intercedes before it, before the throne of God. So therefore, we have an actual reference to angel protectors and angels born with children, actually in the words of Jesus. So these things become very interesting and very important in a strange and mystical way. Now, psychologists would explain it probably in the terms that we are now dealing largely with an aspect of our own subjective, submerged intellect, that we are really thinking out into the open things that we have believed or experienced within ourselves. Science doesn't notice, however, that that is also the way we build great buildings, cathedrals, churches, monuments. Every advancement of knowledge has come from somewhere within and has become a protector for some weakness on the outside. Uh, the, from, the, from the inner, we seek protection for the outer. And we also seek, from the inner, means of glorifying the higher. Uh, these trends and so forth finally emerge in the story of this mysterious being. And the philosophy or science of it, as it appears in its most complete form, is that each person who comes into the world has an invisible spirit that comes with it. That this invisible spirit goes along through the years, guarding, guiding, and leading, taking on the responsibilities of parents when the child or person outgrows his physical parents. And if for some reason the physical parents are not available or not useful or not concerned, the guardian angels start serving even at the time of birth itself and it never leaves during life. And it remains to the very end and guides the individual into the world beyond. In a sense, the guardian angel becomes therefore also the angel of death, the power that leads the person 
into the other life and bestows peace upon it in transition if its moral character has been correct. Now, it wasn't long, however, before the concept of the guardian angel began to have other aspects. If this good spirit uh, was always with us and was always working for us, why do we do so many naughty things? Why doesn't the guardian angel keep us in virtue all our lives? Well, this is a question that theology has never been able to uh, solve in the problem of creation itself. For theology has always been uh, confronted with the Christ and the Antichrist, with the good and the bad. And so in the doctrine of the guardian angel, it was assumed that actually there were two of these powers. One good, as the Greeks pointed out, that went with you to do all that was wonderful and beautiful. And one lurking that would take over if you were wicked and make life completely miserable for you. Now here we have the problem of uh, Goethe's Faust and Mephistopheles, the spirit of evil or negation, which, however, was actually a spirit of retribution by which we ultimately learn to outgrow our own mistakes. But most medieval people, and particularly in the periods when, more, when magic, sorcery, and demonology were prevalent, believed that there were two of these beings. The good spirit they called the guardian angel, and the bad spirit they called the guardian on the threshold. And the guardian on the threshold was a mysterious monstrosity which each individual had to rise above before he could pass to a better life beyond. In other words, this was more or less an embodiment of karma, uh, the type of karma that the individual suffered from as a result of his own misdeeds. And the uh, guardian on the threshold uh, was in control and command of the imperfect life if it was bad enough to deserve such punishment. And then it was the one that took over and took the life back into the material existence again and started the karmic cycle once more. But in the ancient Egyptian and Greek mysteries, there were two guardians at the pillars of the temple. One was the beautiful spirit, very often in Christian art, represented as holding an anchor. And the other was the spirit of the guardian on the threshold, a more, droop, a more gruesome type of thing, uh, and a part animal thing, which was there to test whether or not the individual was worthy to go on to a higher life. These became parts of symbolism and ritual, ritualism and uh, are found in many different beliefs over periods of time. It must be fair to say, however, that the uh, dweller on the threshold was never as popular as the guardian angel. But it was something that also played a part in man's moral life. Because if good protected him, evil dishonored him. And the most important point was that death did not end either. In some mysterious way, what we are survives life on this material planet. Therefore, the idea that we could escape by becoming eternally unaware, if we would simply cease to exist, was something that the ancients couldn't contemplate without asking certain relevant questions. One was, if, we do, if it is possible or if it is inevitable that we cease, then there is really no explanation for why we exist at all. There is no possible idea sensible to man that even in his own limited perspective he contemplates that would put a situation such as we have here and end it with oblivion. We can't imagine the long and painful years of living, the consecrations and dedications, the virtues and the vices, the values and the mistakes, that all ends in nothing. The human mind just couldn't contemplate that. It required a scientific education to be an atheist. Without that, you just can't make it. But if there is something beyond, then that something uh, is worth thinking about. It's also worth striving to understand. 
And uh, in about the early 17th century, we had the rise of a great Christian mysticism, a mysticism which was gradually secularized, but which began undoubtedly in the early church itself. In this mysticism, there were contemplations and thoughts. We had experiences such as those of Emanuel Swedenborg. We had the rise of spiritism in many forms, and finally of spiritualism itself. All these things were man reaching for hope. During World War I, a great many families were disrupted by the loss of a loved one. Immediately, there was a rise of interest in spiritualism. Arthur Conan Doyle, Sir Oliver Lodge, and others spearheaded a revival of spiritualistic phenomena because of loss and pain, because of man trying to understand why the problems of sorrow should be brought to the earth by man's own conniving, why he should make for himself tragedy and involve others in it. So the uh, whole problem of the guardian angel finally summarizes in man's de infinite need something to help this sadness, this uh, de deprivation from which so many suffer. And this type of thing is especially noticeable probably in the older age groups. So many older people live alone. So many are disillusioned, embittered. Many live with their griefs day and night. Others try to forget everything. And always before them is a curtain, a veil, through which they must sometime pass. Without something to help in this, it is inevitable that the human estate would not be glorified. But the answer does seem to be in the realization that there is something. There is something there to protect us, something there for us to understand and to do something about. And little by little, it was introduced into the fact that in some way, this guardian angel could communicate with us. He communicate with us actually, even though uh, we couldn't see it and didn't know very much about it. We felt its guiding influence. We felt that when we were in trouble, it sort of stood by and tried to show us a way out. It was there on cases of temptation. It was there to wag its finger at us more or less reprovingly when we used bad words. Actually, there was something that was another kind of parent, something that uh, would correct, correct our faults protect our virtues, and be there when most needed. So we began to think about it a little bit, and finally we gave this thing a name. And I think that probably this name problem is the key to the whole thing. We said that the guardian angel communicated with mankind through conscience, that some mysterious way, conscience was a being, an entity, and that that entity was constantly there to help. That somewhere in our known natures there was a realization of good and evil that was superior to dogma, theology, or the vicissitudes of, a, in, of an inconsistent economy. Somewhere in us there was something that said, oh, don't do it. Or on another occasion, you can't say that, it isn't true. And if you go against this guardian angel, they said that it wept. Well, conscience weeps, because sometimes conscience, we conscience weeps for a lifetime over one mistake. We do not get over completely the evils that we commit or the problems that we cause for other people, and we can't hide it from the guardian angel. And how could we hide it from our own conscience? Therefore, in many ways, it would appear uh, that the guardian angel is a symbol and an embodiment of the power of the human soul. That in the soul is something that is born with us, that's with us all our lives, that God grows up with us, and after death goes on to testify to us. This sort of made a, a bit of sense with some of the more modern constructive uh, psychotherapists 
that in a, in a mysterious way there was something. That there is something in each individual that is better than the rest of him. It is not uh, fair just to simply call it God. It is too abstract. It is true that God bestows life and is the final source of all. But the good life seems to come to those who make certain additional contributions to their own salvation. The good life is for those who some way find a way of truth in the midst of all these difficulties. So the conscience becomes the symbol for, as it says uh, in Hamlet, for conscience doth make cowards of us all. Every time we outrage conscience, we suffer. Every time we go against it, we regret it. And yet, in many cases, conscience is something we would love to forget. We wish we could go against it because it interferes with so many things that we want to do. But what are the things that it interferes with? We now realize more and more that the things it interferes with are things that we should not do. And that the idea that it is simply a disciplinarian for no good reason, that it is a tyrant, simply cannot be sustained. It is also true that conscience is forever growing in a mysterious way, or appears to be. Whether it is actually growing is not so certain. Perhaps it is manifesting itself a little more all the time. Because things that we might have done at one stage of life without feeling a bad conscience become the source of conscience regrets if we grow older and commit the same actions. And uh, if in any way uh, the conscience uh, does get uh, adversely used, then we realize that there is a support in society for conscience. That conscience is tied into our legal codes, into our ethics, our morality, and all of our human relationships. It is tied into our sacraments and the qualifications of faith. It is bestowed in the problems of baptism, and it is with us in the last moment of extreme unction. The conscience is right there. And if we do really believe that it is there and is our power of right and is our ever-present stre strength in time of trouble, then it becomes a, a very valuable and important part of ourselves. Also, there seems to be some relationship between conscience now and conscience in the past. We seem to be born into this world on different degrees of conscience levels. Some have a higher standard of what is right than others. Some have one virtue, some have another virtue. And in religion particularly, the education of these virtues can be largely sectarian. Some religions consider virtues other things that we and other faiths believe to be vices. So conscience is related intimately to our own needs, our own degrees of understanding, our own insights into values, and the immediate problems that we must face on our own social levels. So let's assume for a moment now that conscience has become, say, the voice of the guardian angel. And it certainly can well be considered as such because we know that these impulses arise and we realize socially and otherwise that when we go against them, there is trouble. Now, if we go against them, this other little problem of the uh, guardian on the threshold will come into focus. Once we begin to deceive or corrupt our integrities, it becomes easier and easier. And false guidance comes to us. A false guidance which is largely the result of the pressure from the outside so that we divide between the guardian angel and the guardian on the threshold in this way that one, the guardian angel, represents the descent of spiritual grace. The other the guardian on the threshold is a false concept or false standard of integrity that is built upon the contamination by worldliness. 
So one is a contamination and the other is a regeneration. The contamination part becomes more and more common. But as we watch around us, we see that it is always a spirit of decline. It is always something that is destroying rather than helping. We realize how war destroys, how crime destroys, how degeneracy destroys. And we know that the appetites to these things do not originate in God, nor do they originate in the good angel or the guardian angel. They are the testimonies of the external uh, sensory perceptions in cases where the individual has never learned to control himself. They represent the pressures of the animal instincts which still lurk within the human constitution. So it all sums up now to one general conclusion, that at least in part, <coughs> the guardian angel is a symbol of the human soul. The soul itself is that power of good which determines our integrities, which guides us and leads us through the issues of life. The soul is something that we can all depend upon. We can depend upon it for all of the strength that is necessary to face the problems of the day. We are never without proper guidance. <coughs> we are never without the ability uh, to find the way to do things. Now, the Egyptian has a little classification here that was rather intriguing. That in a sense that the human soul is really sevenfold. And the mortal dweller on the threshold is also sevenfold. In other words, the Egyptians believed that man himself had seven souls. And that after death, six of these souls gradually die. But the seventh soul is eternal and goes on to the next embodiment, is reborn and continues to be the reborn guardian soul in the new life. And these very, the seven souls of good represent the seven cardinal virtues of the church. They represent the seven integrities that are regarded as the basis of, the, of acceptability in the sight of God. Each of these has its own areas, and it becomes obvious that in the course of evolution, some of these uh, virtues either no longer are effective or are transformed in some way. The lower virtues that belong to the physical life, of course, are the ones that die first because we do not take them so far into the other life. We do not go against them, but they, we no longer need them. And finally, the radiance of the great soul principle itself absorbs the seven degrees of its own nature and becomes a shining mystery, a spiritual planetarium in which the seven stars of the ancients shine in the structure of the human soul. The soul, therefore, has its controls, its divisions, its subdivisions. And in some instances, the ancients believed that there were several guardian angels assigned to each person for various reasons. For example, supposing this person was decide, had decided to become a priest, the guardian angel would be therefore able to select a priestly guardian for that life. Another one wished to be an artist, and in addition to the natal daemon, as it was called, there was a special angel appointed to perfect beauty in the life of that person. All beautiful and good things come from beings and not from circumstances or incidents. That which is, as one ancient said, that which is great enough and strong enough to bring a man to his knees in the presence of a great painting is not dead, it is alive. Beauty is a living thing. Beauty is a part of the soul. All parts of the good in man are soul powers. And those that go against these soul powers uh, lose or are deficient and gradually d drop back again to a comparatively animal level of existence. The soul, therefore, is the substance of the good, the beautiful, and the uh, aspiring. 
as, as we have said on some occasions before, when Stradivarius was asked how he happened to make violins, he replied, God made Antonio to make violins. And in this concept of the uh, guardian soul, when the soul comes into life, it is supposed to have the power to select within a certain range what it will do with life after it gets here. It chooses its own career and faces the problems before they occur. And if he decides, like Stradivarius, to make violins, a great artist, a great musical muse, a great musical sibyl will come with him to guide him through his years. Not only because of his need, but this is a service performed by the guardian angels because in their coming and helping the individual to fulfill his own greatness or his own needs, they are also contributing to the glory of the world and all that is necessary for the perfection of human endeavor. Whoever the guardian angel was that watched over Michelangelo served all mankind. But the ancients believed that definitely this was a spirit and that this spirit would only come when truth prevailed that it would only come and give beauty when integrity was there. And there is a story of a couple of art critics wandering through the Luxembourg Gallery in Paris, and they came upon the works of an artist, and they contained, uh, they studied them, and they worked it over, and finally one of them said, this is an exceptionally fine painting. And the other one said, yes, it is his greatest work, because he was in love when he did it. And this was again the angel, because if the love was sincere and pure, the angel was there to help. So all through the integrities of things are the stories of the guardian angels. And I think it might be very wonderful if somewhere along the line, someone would try take this concept and write something about it into a small child book, a book for little children, a book of fairy tales, for tales that in which the fairies are the powers of the human soul, in which the child is given an idea that the love in it, the love that may make it love a doll, is also part of a great love principle that exists in nature, and that this principle, like all others, is alive. It is not simply something that comes out of nothing. It is one of the divine births of God, for it is said in the ancient Kabbalah and in other works that when God formed all things in his own likeness, he formed many things in his likeness that are invisible because those parts of himself are invisible. But that everything in the world, whether it is visible or invisible, has conscience, has laws, has principles. Sometimes these principles are revealed only by the stratifications of a tree or the fission of a gem. Sometimes they are in the mother love of the tiger for its cubs. Whatever it is, but it is part of a universal process that overshadows the physical concerns of life. Now at this season of the year, we are coming towards a season especially sacred to over a billion human beings. This season is one in which the concept of the guardian angel may be most interesting, for nearly always the Annunciation was represented as bestowed or communicated by the angel Gabriel. Actually, the vision of what was to come, the divine message, comes to us not from the outside, but through the inner part of our own nature. And the soul is definitely the link between the invisible causes of things and their visible consequences. The soul, if studied scientifically, may be a problem in vibration. The vibrations of things tell their virtues and their vices. Therefore, if a negative emotion or attitude arises, damage is done in the magnetic fields of the human body. We are all living on vibration in one form or another. We may call it energy, we may call it vitality, but actually vibration is the source of our lives. It maintains everything 
that can possibly happen. And its rates change as we change. Vibration changes with every thought that comes into the mind. The study of the magnetic fields of bodies proves conclusively that the moment an individual becomes selfish, the light around him changes. And one who can see that light knows the selfishness has moved in. Now, selfishness, of course, is toxic. All negative vibrations are toxic. Everything that we shouldn't do and we insist on doing is a damage to the whole composite nature which, with which we were endowed. Everywhere, however, where a noble or beautiful thought is fulfilled, the vibration clears, the lights brighten, the soft glows continue, and in a strange way, every cell in the human being feels better. It is better because the magnetic field is wrapping it in light and not in darkness. So it is the right of every creature and every being uh, to improve for the sake of its own peace of mind, its own health, its own success in life. And the vibrations of the guardian angel can reach out into our physical existence also. The guardian angels makes us better to live with, kinder in our works. It gives us, they give us more patience, understanding. They have visions of better things than we would normally contemplate. And all through the years of life, if we follow the footsteps of this spirit guide, so to say, we will uh, achieve a great deal more. The guardian angel, of course, is not a deceased relative. It is not a spiritualistic phenomena. It is not something that simply carries on uh, from the other side a continuance of this material life. <laughs> this is another type of spiritism entirely. The guardian angel is part of the causal nature of existence. It is part of the infinite plan in which we live. And so if we can, on these occasions, understand this, it may help us to also appreciate more completely the wonderful season of Christmas in which we are now uh, coming. A Christmas which is being blurred and damaged because we are not listening to the voices of conscience. We are not really trying to do what the guardian angel would have us do. Now, there's a grave question as to whether the guardian angel is much interested in prosperity or is much interested in extravagant gift-taking or making. It would not be this at all. The guardian angel's rejoicing comes with thought, with love, with sincerity, with devotion, with self-sacrifice in causes greater than ourselves. The uh, guardian angel doesn't want us to give something we have it wants us to give something we are. It wants us to share a life with someone or with something, to reach out and touch that which is in pain or sorrow and do something about it. The guardian angel becomes the spirit of charity and which is just one of its attributes, one of the virtues which it represents. And everything that is beautiful, everything that is good, finally in its source becomes an aspect of this mysterious being this power of good that uh, lives with us, works with us, suffers with us. And there are old pictures and old symbols showing the guardian angel weeping because of the failure of the person to accept the challenge of integrity. And other countries and other parts of the world have found different ways of representing these, these powers but all in all, there are not too much difference in them. They are impelling the person constantly to the accomplishment of something. It is the guardian angel that impels some people to become members of the clergy. It is the guardian angel that makes some people be parents and good members of a family. It is the guardian angel also that wants to see that the little one born into the world is born into a ha happy and loving family. It wants to have the parents feel its presence from within themselves. The true father and mother will be the one whose impulses and urges are those of the guardian angel, that they have accepted the guidance and guardianship of a life. 
All these very sensitive, gentle things belong to a way of life that's hard for us to understand. And it's also very difficult for us not to assume that these things are antique or moribund or that they don't exist anymore, that we're not expected to do these kind of things. They all belong to the past. Well, there are a number of ways in which the past, in a strange way, was more beautiful than the present. Now, we all know that in the great evolutionary course of things, the past was necessary, that we had to leave it behind. But there is no reason why any of us at any time should leave behind anything that is good that was ever in the world. Because all this good is locked within the concept of the guardian angel. It brings with us the wisdom of the past. It gives us the insights and the moralities and the integrities of long ago. It bestows the impulses to dedications, to self-sacrifice. It creates the people like Mohandas Gandhi. It also creates the Abraham Lincolns. These are people living by virtue of the soul within them. Each one has gradually revealed out of its own life uh, the workings of the guardian angel. And all guardian angels, when they work, transform people into guardians also. The guardian angel was the power uh, that manifested itself in Lincoln when he became a guardian of a new way of life in this country. The guardian angel always works through service, through giving, through sharing, through contributing various virtues. In the ancient times, the people like Pythagoras had their spirits. Pythagoras was regarded as an embodiment of Apollo. He also had a, an attendant muse that was with him. Each of these people, according to legends, were guided by mysterious beings that accompanied them. Uh, it was a muse, or it was maybe a guardian angel, that appeared to the Emperor Julian and told him to take the purple. He only reigned for less than two years but the angel told him that was his duty. Others have probably inspired men like Luther to retire into banishment and spend his life translating the Bible. But wherever there is a labor to be done, it is the progress of the soul in man that makes that labor possible. Growth comes from the soul, not from the mind or the body. And the growth that comes from the soul has always been regarded as the blessing of the guardian angel. So each person in his own way may have this wonderful being working for him and with him and by him in all of the works of life. We certainly realize that in a mysterious way, and according to the early church, when the, the Christian dispensation was fully established, that it gradually usurped the powers of the guardian angel. And the, one of the early church fathers said that the guardian angel of the whole world is now the spirit of Jesus Christ. That the guardian angels have all given their authority to him. But on the other hand, the church admits that he works through the guardian angels also. They bow before him but they still do his work. So there was this belief in the church, and it has continued to the present time, that man is never left without help. That even when things seem to be so bad, you do not know what to do next. Where tragedy seems to move in on every side, that there is not only help, but insight. Another virtue of the guardian angel is insight. Our tendency is to accept and reject without much consideration or thought. We do as we feel like doing, and we try to accept things as we feel about them and not give much attention. But insight is the power of the individual, which when strengthened by faith in the presence of a guardian spirit, the insight is what the guardian angel tells us about the real reason for the things that happen. The guardian angel then gradually brings through conscience and through inner experience 
the realization that everything that happens to the individual is important. Everything is, that happens is a discipline of some kind. It is a kind of an initiation into the great mysteries of existence. Every sorrow is an opportunity to grow bigger. Every loss is a gain of some kind. Everything we have is a challenge for use. Everything we lose is something to give up with graciousness and kindness. Every friend is to be cultivated. Every enemy is to be reconverted into friendship. There is nothing that negative to be left unchanged, nothing that is positive to be overlooked. This becomes perhaps the greatest of all Christian disciplines. It becomes perhaps the fulfillment of the whole story that we recognize in the life of Christ. Christ represents to many, many people someone, some being from God who came to perfect, protect people to save humanity from the weaknesses of their own natures. And this process of saving is, is not to be fulfilled or cannot be fulfilled unless the Christ in you performs the labor. And in a sense, the guardian angels are the aspects, ministers of the Christ power in man. And uh, they follow the commandments of the New Testament and of the Last Supper and the Sermon on the Mount. For the guardian angel tells us to keep the rules. The guardian angel says, forgive your enemy. Now we don't have to forgive the enemy. We have the power of limited determinism, as St. Thomas Aquinas called it. We don't have to forgive the enemy. But if we do not forgive the enemy, we have lost contact with truth. Something is lost in us. Something has been done that has defiled us. We have not fulfilled that which our highest spiritual dedication should make necessary. We, are, we have allowed personal things, animosities, antagonisms, jealousies, revenges, to take over, all of which are abominations, as they are called in the Bible. Therefore, that uh, we are all are trying to do is to find the courage to follow conscience, to follow the integrities of life, and to go on according to the spirit of our faith, a spirit which depends for its perfection, its manifestation, and its fulfillment upon us. And uh, in that moment, we say, I can't quite make it. I'm not strong enough. There's too much pressure against me. I'm just not big enough to do it. I'm not strong enough. I'm not wise enough. I haven't enough insight to forgive this person who has injured me so long. I can't get over the grief or the grudge or something of this nature. Well, if we are perfectly quiet under those conditions and just let nature have its own way, the guardian angel will help. It will come in as the period of conscience. It will kind of reveal to us all of the elements and factors that are necessary to a proper adjustment. First, it will calm the antagonisms. It will help us to realize that these attitudes are not of God, but belong, if they to anything, to the anti-God or anti-Christ that there is nothing to be gained by per per perpetuating evil. And then perhaps we will say to the conscience, but I I'd like to, but I can't forget. I can never forget what has happened. And the guardian angel says, don't forget, understand. And if you do that, you will probably find that you can transform the injury into soul power and soul growth. And when you do that, the guardian angel will pat you lightly on the back and let you know that you have succeeded in something. So it's kind of nice to think about the idea that there's someone around that is on our side of almost anything, as long as we are on the side of truth. If we can be on the side of the realities of life, there is always something that's with us, something invisible, but something real. Perhaps we want to call it the higher part of ourselves, 
Perhaps we want to think of it only as the soul which we have received from God. Perhaps we'd like to think of it as an elder brother somewhere or an older sister who's kind of watching over or a kind of spiritual parent who never fails. But whatever we want to consider it, the belief in a guardian angel has undoubtedly contributed a great deal to the moral growth of mankind. Whether it's demonstrable or provable or not, it is a beautiful necessity. It is something we're all better for believing, whereas doubts and negative attitudes do nothing to help. They do not give us any further strength or insight with which to labor for the perfection of our society or the adv advancement of our own ethics. It is therefore very good at this time to kind of try to make, quaint, make an acquaintance of this character in yourself. Try to find the guardian angel. All you have to do to find it is to be quiet for a moment and think a beautiful thought and it's there. Just don't give up the attitudes of a being that is all love and is with you always and therefore is always available to express itself in your own love for all values that are right and for all duties that need the doing. I think that's in the spirit of Christmas and I hope it's kind of, you know, touches things up a little bit. Thank you.